Welcome to From Amiens to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director for the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we visit Sunken Lane and Hawthorne Crater. It was in Sunken Lane the cameraman Geoffrey Malins filmed the Lancashire Fusiliers waiting to attack Beaumont Hamel on the morning of the 1st July 1916, shortly before the explosion of the Hawthorne Ridge mine. Our second location, the Sunken Lane. If you've ever seen a documentary on the First World War, you've probably seen film footage of a very large explosion rising up out of the ground, a great mushroom of yeah, soil being thrown into the sky, a mine exploding. Now that mine was the Hawthorne mine, which was blown only a very short distance from here. On your cards, you've got a series of pictures. These are stills from a film that was filmed here on the morning of the 1st July in 1916 by a British Army cameraman called Geoffrey Malins. We've also got Geoffrey Malin's diary account of what he saw when he was here on the morning of the 1st of July. So we've used the photographs to try and give a sense of what was here. Now we've got somebody's description. The tunnel from our front line was no more than two foot six inches wide and five foot deep. The journey seemed endless as I dragged my camera along by the strap attached to the case. At last we came to the exit. Keep down low, sir. The sap's only four foot deep. My guide was crouching there, and in front of him, about 30 feet away, running at right angles on both sides, was a roadway, overgrown with grass and pitted with shell holes. The bank immediately in front was lined with the stumps of trees and a rough hedge, and there, lined up, crouching as close to the bank as possible, were some of our men. They were the Lancashire Fusiliers, with bayonets fixed and ready to spring forward. I set my camera up and filmed. Some of them looked happy. Others, with stern, set faces, realising the great task in front of them. I finished taking my scenes. Packing up my camera, I prepared to return. Time was getting on. It was now 6.30am. A whole hour before the attack would start. And those men, veterans themselves of the Gallipoli campaign, lined up along this roadway, waiting to go into attack. We're going to walk down to the bottom and just round the corner so we can see the battlefield. You can now start to appreciate how open this battlefield is. The British lines running a couple hundred metres to the rear there. The German front line running effectively along the edge are the woods that you can see there, protecting the village of beaumont -Hamel. That is the distance the Lancashire Fusiliers now need to cross when the whistles blow at 7.30. The mine to destroy a German defensive position up on the ridge will be blown at 7.20, 10 minutes before the attack starts. Meanwhile, the Germans are over there watching listening and waiting. You're going to walk across the ground Lancashire Fusiliers walked across. When I call your number, I want you to stand still. And the signal for you to start walking will be the exact same signal that the Lancashire Fusiliers heard on the morning of the 1st July 1916 at 7.30. A blast on an officer's whistle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
Barely any of them get any further than this. Some of them are hit the minute they leave the safety of the Duncan Lane. Others make it out into no man's land. Some will make it across no man's land. But the majority, their attack will get this far. If you look at your little groups, one of you has probably just been killed. One of you is probably now wounded and the others of you are thinking, how on earth am I going to get back to the safety of the sunken lane now that I am lying in full view of the enemy? In a similar way to the Newfoundland Regiment just up over the hill, a disastrous attack. We're going to walk up onto the ridge to the Hawthorne Crater, to the shade of the trees, to look at the German perspective on this battlefield at that time. My name is Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. It's about quarter to twelve French time on the 7th of August 2018. A beautiful summer's day, strong sunshine, much as it was on the 1st of July 1916. I'm close to the village of Beaumont Hamel on the Somme front by the Hawthorne Ridge Crater, created at 7.20 in the morning on the 1st of July, just before the infantry attack went in. We're standing on the line of the German positions. The Germans had held these positions on the Somme since September 1914. There was fighting here in that month, in September 1914, as both sides tried to outflank each other in the so-called race to the sea, the move back up to the northern coast. But after that, it was a relatively quiet sector. And so the Germans are able to hold the high ground, very often to hold what the army would call the reverse slope, that is to be off the crest and out of direct observation, but to hold strongly immediately behind the crest. So to be out of direct fire, but be able quickly, of course, to hold high ground if need be. They had time, too, to choose their fields of fire, to prepare their machine guns and their artillery, knowing that they had certain sighting points that they could create what in military terms we call killing zones, areas through which troops would have to advance, which therefore could be predicted. Here on the Hawthorne Ridge, we are on high ground. We're looking over rolling countryside, comparatively short fields of fire and of vision, about probably 400 yards from the position known to the British as the Sunken Road, a position which, because it was within a sunken road, provided cover before the attack, with a comparatively short distance to cover between that and the German front line, the position from which the Lancashire Fusiliers attacked at 7.30 in the morning on the 1st of July. The big debate in the British attack relates to the timing of the attack in relation to the artillery bombardment. The artillery bombardment effectively finished at 5.30 in the morning. There was then hurricane bombardment, so-called, but it's not until 7.30 a.m. that the infantry attack actually goes in, by which time, of course, the sun is up and the light is good. There was no attempt to use the first light of the early morning. Instead, this attack goes in the full blast of sunlight. Some units of the British Army, particularly on the southern sector of the Somme Front, move into no man's land under the cover of the artillery bombardment so that they're already halfway to their positions. And broadly speaking, the units that did that had a greater degree of success. In this case, the Lancashire Fusiliers have done that. They have moved forward. They are ready to go. They're not over-equipped. They're able to move comparatively freely without heavy packs, but with the equipment which they need to consolidate the positions if they successfully gain them. It still ends in disaster. And one of the reasons for that is not just the well-sighted German positions, but the decision to blow the mine in the Hawthorne Ridge at 7.20. So there's a 10-minute gap between the ridge mine being blown and the launching of the infantry attack, with those infantry still having to cross no man's land. In other words, there is enough time for the German defence to react. So even Germans who have taken cover in the deep dugouts that are available to them 
have time to come up, man their machine guns, alert their artillery and respond accordingly. From where I stand on the edge of the crater of the mine, I can see, and I'm now looking directly up the German front line, I can see one cemetery and then another cemetery marking the positions in no man's land where most of the Lancashire Fusiliers fell, a matter of most 100 yards from their starting points, and even those at the extremity of where they got to. It's an indication of just how effective the defensive positions, the defensive fire of the Germans were. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we visit Caterpillar Valley Cemetery, where we explore how the Somme offensive developed beyond the 1st of July 1916.